What's up, potheads and political junkies? You're watching Cannabis Culture News Live. I'm Jeremiah Vandermeer, editor of Cannabis Culture Magazine, here with David Malmo Levine. And it's Friday the 13th. Now, hopefully, you can hear us right now. Marius, how's that volume working? It, are you, are it actually you, works. Are you receiving Amazing. me? Amazing. See, because it's Friday the 13th, there won't be any technical problems today. Knock Good on wood. Uh, yeah, knock on your wooden dome or my wooden shoes. Since I'm a Dutchman. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, you see. Been... So, uh, David, I'm going to have you. We're going to go to you first, but I'm just going to quickly set up who else is on the show besides super activist David Malmo Levine, who today is acting as an info pirate, and uh, or it, your, your article is about info piracy. Did, did you post it? It's posted on the front page of Cannabis Culture. Yeah! Yeah, baby. So, we'll talk to David about his new blog. Also on the show, big news today, this morning, Hash and edibles, pot edibles, are now legal for medical marijuana patients in Canada, effective immediately. A court case in Victoria this morning determined the judge threw out the laws saying they're unconstitutional, that dried marijuana specifically is the, th the thing he threw out. He said that uh, from now on, it's any type of marijuana, not just dried. That's right. Yeah, so that's... You got your doctor's note. Brownies are legit. Tinctures are legit. That's right. Suppositories are legit <laughs> they were always legit <laughs> that's just a delivery method i always found the smoke ring never, so hard to never blow tried to hoop a whole bud david <laughs> <laughs> well that's another story for another time <laughs> also so kirk Tusaw, lawyer in the case will be joining us by telephone he's driving home so we'll get him on the phone uh they were just in court <laughs> twice today so he'll be i'm sure a little haggard hopefully on his on his drive, he'll be able to, to get through to us, and there won't be too much static. Sometimes we he's, do have that problem. He's with got it. a hand-free unit. That's right. I, I don't think he's got a stick in his car, so it's an automatic. It's easy uh, yeah. to... Oh, hands-free, yeah, I guess you have to You have days. to legally. It's illegal. Yeah, oh. if you're a lawyer, especially, you you got to know that stuff. That's right. <laughs> so we'll call it a hands-free unit. Kirk's hands-free unit. Just irregardless. And also on the show... And it's her first time on the show, which is great. I haven't had her on before, and I've always wanted to. Lisa Mamakine Kirkman will be on to talk about her book, Sex Pot, which is totally awesome. She will be joining us more towards the end of the show after Mr. Kirk Tusaw. Now, I've also got some news and stuff to go through at the top of the show, but we're going to let David go first here, David. So See tell this? us about your blog, and what is this giant... Well, before I tell you about my blog, okay. I'm going to tell you about this thing. This is 100% hemp rope. From, uh, you call, uh, what do you call, uh, Romania there? From Romania? Yes. This hemp rope will be on display in the new second floor, extra specially cool, uh, increased uh, sized mushroom and hemp display that we're going to create there. Increased size? Yes, yes. We're going to expand these sections of the herb museum so that they can be what they should have been all along but we just didn't have the space for until now they're going to be in the movie theater section of the second floor so for those who don't know here at 307 west hastings we have a three floor empire that's right and the second floor is now rocking it's open people right. are smoking and token and hitting the bong and rolling and all that and vaping Vaping their heads but off. David, on the when will they floor. be learning? When is the museum open? Well, uh, we're aiming for Sunday as the first day, but uh, that's just a soft opening. The hard opening is coming up on the 26th. We're going to have a big shindig, art auction, and grand opening celebration of the Herb Museum. Stay tuned. For that, we're going to have a little announcement on the front page of Cannabis Culture coming up I'm actually shortly. a fan of the soft openings myself. You like the soft openings? You know, I like all the openings because uh, oh, it's more I fun to have more than one opening. You know what I'm saying? I have several. Yes? You've had several openings? I have several openings, yes. But you have no museum. <laughs> Verily, it is a melon scratcher. So, uh, so let's talk about... on display. Hemp rope and a bunch of other hemp stuff. And a uh, really interesting, informative hemp display on the wall and a very informative mushroom display on the wall as well. You can come down to get a crash course in how mushrooms and hemp can help save the world, clean the soil of radioactivity, reverse climate change, replace oil so there's no more oil wars and oil spills, and literally create heaven on earth from this hell we are living in today. And now the blog. 
Yes. The Blob. Part two. Part two. Also, the coolest thing ever, all 19 issues of my magazine, Podshot, are now uploaded to podshot.ca. And there is a blog, a blog, defending my right to steal information and make it available to the people. That, that legal defense of necessity, which is basically it's okay to commit a small crime in order to prevent a big crime. That legal defense is now uploaded to the home page at the top of the blog list, cannabisculture.com. But this legal defense, uh, I didn't notice in your blog it included, has it ever been tried before? Necessity has been tried in other areas. Never, I think... In, in order to justify um, copyright, copyright violations. <laughs> but uh, I'm prepared to any day, if anyone wants to sue me or get me in trouble in any way over the uh, information I have stolen for Podshot Magazine, I'll see you in court. Well, and actually in Canada, it turns out that our laws are a little more harsh than in the US. Mm. In the US, there are allowances through fair use laws for content and for educational purposes. So There's if you're not no, using it for a commercial purpose. No fair use in Canada? Well, they do have something called fair dealing in Canada. Hey, I like fair that. Dealing. I'm all for it's fair dealing. Back We're back. Wow. So Friday the 13th, I thought it was going to be a clean show with no technical problems, but sorry, guys. There's technical problem number one. Hopefully you could actually hear most of David talking in the background and singing. Uh, and hopefully you didn't miss out on too much. I know it was a black screen for a while, but if that happens, just let us know in the chat. It must be getting close to 420, isn't it? Nice. Oh, the new bong. Yeah, I just borrowed this bong from the Vapor Lounge, actually, because Princess is downstairs. Uh, I just didn't bring her up this morning. So we're going to have to hit out, out of this beaker, this scientific beaker we have here. Also, the High Guy brand, which is one of my favorites. I really like the tall, skinny bongs. Uh, and I'm smoking some good stuff here. I believe this is Sister M that was given to me, although it's mixed in with a bunch of other buds, so it's hard to tell sometimes. Um, and speaking of analyzing different strains, if you go to the front page of Cannabis Culture right now, there's an article by Matt Murnau called How to Photograph, Can or How to Photograph Marijuana, I believe is the title, and you should check out his video. He's doing a lot of pot photography for his new book on Green Candy Press, which is due out soon. So check out his latest article. Marius, I'm gonna hit this bong. Um, after that, I think we're gonna fo forego some of our news stories that we had because of our delay there, and uh, we're gonna bring Kirk Tusaw, lawyer, on the phone, just a minute to talk about the cannabis case this morning. Bit of a splash there, but quite a nice hit. Delicious. I love the bombs. All right. So should we do this with Kirk straight up, or should we go to um, any of the clips there? Maybe we'll go to just a super short clip while we get Kirk on the phone. I actually have two very short clips at the top, Marius. Now, these two clips are from uh, a new group here in Canada that's called comeoutoncannabis.ca. Now, they've been putting out these educational shorts, and I'll play both of them for you, and you guys check out their website. Marius? Theoretically, marijuana prohibition keeps drugs away from young people. In reality, marijuana is cheaper and easier to obtain than alcohol for many teens because alcohol is regulated and marijuana is not. Adults can make their own decisions, but drug dealers don't check ID. Let's talk marijuana policy for the real world. Come out on cannabis.ca. Theoretically, marijuana is illegal in Canada because it's what Canadians want and need. In reality, 53% of Canadians favor marijuana legalization. After over a year of investigation, the Senate Special Committee on Illegal Drugs concluded that the continued prohibition of cannabis jeopardizes the health and well-being of Canadians much more than does the substance itself. Let's talk marijuana policy for the real world. Come out on cannabis.ca. Are we back? Did it work? 
All right, so we're back, and now we're calling Kirk. And hopefully he'll be able to hear us here. <laughs> We've got him dialing in. Mr. Tusaw. Hey, man. I'm excellent. Good to hear from you, Kirk. Congratulations on the case this morning. So, Kirk, can you sort of just give us a little bit of uh, what the judge actually decided today? Can you talk to us about that? Uh, absolutely. So, uh, the decision today was on uh, my client Owen Smith's application for relief pursuant to the charter. Uh, we had what's called a voir dire, a try with it, trial within a trial, on the issue of whether or not the MMAR uh, were constitutional or not. And depending on that result, whether or not Mr. Smith should get a judicial stay of proceedings and have the case against him end. Uh, the judge today decided that the MMAR restriction to dried cannabis only uh, did violate the charter, uh, violated section seven of the charter and the uh, rights to liberty and security of the person, uh, including the health rights of uh, patients who want to use cannabis in forms other than uh, dried cannabis smoked or vaporized. Uh, he ruled that uh, because of that infringement, uh, it was not in conformity with the criminal justice, um, primarily because the rule is the trick. It doesn't hurt the legislation, uh, but at the same time, it does deprive of uh, their sexual rights. They're interest, you know, choosing which motivation best their medical condition. Uh, he, he referred to that, that the violence of sexual was not saved by sexual charter. You know what, Kirk? I th I'm breaking up with you there. I'm having a hard time hearing you. Can you hear me okay? No, sorry. That's okay. Uh, I, I know you're driving right now. Yeah, it's been a long day and just headed home to hopefully watch the uh, Red Wings beat Predators and of course the Canucks uh, beat the Kings after that. <laughs> but basically, the, the violation was not saved by Section One of the ch Charter, and so what he had—it's really sort of interesting because in the morning session, what he ruled was uh, he was going to, as a remedy, he was not going to grant a judicial stay to my client, so my client's going to have a jury trial sometime in the future. But because of the MMAR restrictions unconstitutional. Uh, he was going to strike the word dried out of the MMAR and leave it, you know, just marijuana. Uh, unfortunately, as I pointed out to him, and to their credit, the crowd agreed um, in the afternoon session when we went back at two, uh, unfortunately that, that remedy didn't achieve what he wanted to achieve. I mean, what the judge wanted to achieve was, you know, people with licenses to possess marijuana ought to be able to make teas and topical oils and make cookies with it. Uh, that's what he wanted to achieve, but because of the way marijuana is defined in the regulations, just striking out dried didn't do that. And so we pointed that out to him this afternoon. He did change the judgment and correct that logical flaw. Uh, and then we argued about not the declaration of it suspended it on. Uh oh, we're losing you, Kirk. Can you hear me? Uh, that's a little better. In, in past cases, declarations of invalidity have been suspended for a year to let the government sort of fill the void. And uh, we argued a bit about that this afternoon. And we're going to go back and argue some more about it on the 27th of April because uh, it's a bit complicated. But between now and the 27th of April, if you have an authorization to possess, if you're a patient, if you're a consumer of the of the medicine, you are entitled to possess uh, the derivative products, the oils, the tinctures, the, the, the resin, the, the, you know, the topicals, the edibles, and the cookies and things like that. Uh, so you're protected until the 27th of April, and then we're going to go back and argue about whether or not that protection should continue uh, or whether we should, it should be suspended pending an appeal. Right, so it's not quite as clear cut as uh, we thought it was this morning then. No, uh, no, and it, you know, in law, what is really clear cut, but, but it's a huge victory. 
authorized persons under the medical scheme can now make cookies lawfully without fear of arrest or prosecution. They can make oils and things like that. Uh, and it remains to be seen whether that will also be applicable to designated producers, personal producers, uh, and other producers, or uh, whether that will be suspended pending some kind of appeal. Kurt, can you just briefly... my client has yeah. a jury trial facing them. Sorry, say that again, Kurt? Well, my client still has a jury trial in front of them on the issue of his guilt or innocence, and... Uh, it, and on the issue of the common law defense of medical necessity. Right. Maybe, Kirk, you can explain to our viewers a little bit about the case itself and, you know, what, what was the situation here? Well, sure. My client, Owen Smith, was a, a baker and a maker of edible and topical cannabis-based products for the Cannabis Buyers Club of Canada. Uh, that is a medical cannabis uh, dispensary located in Victoria, B.C., one of the oldest uh, such organizations, uh, probably in North America. Uh, Ted Smith, the proprietor, has been doing it for quite a long time. And they service people with permanent physical diseases or disabilities. Uh, Mr. Smith was arrested for uh, uh, trafficking in THC on the basis of, uh, after his apartment, was, which has been used as a bakery, was raided, on the basis of you know THC being in the oils and in the cookies. And we raised a challenge to the government's regulatory scheme saying essentially that it's arbitrary and irrational for the government to permit people to grow and smoke marijuana but not to permit them a, a safer and perhaps more effective form of administration in the form of oils and edibles, topicals and creams. The, the club has some 30 skin or, or edible products. Right. So that's fantastic. This is a huge win for them. But so, uh, Kirk, you were talking about you know the the rest of the case. There's more to this. Can you tell us about what happens next for Owen? Yeah, for Owen uh, personally, we're going to go back on the 25th of April. We're going to fix a date for his jury trial. Um, I anticipate the jury issues for the jury will be uh, whether the common law defense of medical necessity applies, and we'll be arguing, of course, that since these products were unlawful at the time Owen was doing this, uh, that, you know, he reasonably felt it was necessary and was compelled to provide these sick people with these medicines that they couldn't otherwise get. Uh, and we're obviously hopeful that that will be successful. Um, you know, who knows what developments may occur between now and whatever the jury trial is going to be remains to be seen. Uh, and then, of course, the, the appeal would not occur until at the conclusion of that jury trial. So it would, is this win going to help those cases? I didn't, I didn't hear that, Jeremy. Sorry. Uh, Kirk, I was just asking if this win will be a benefit it, to those future cases. Because you guys won this particular case, does that help for future cases? Oh, I think it does, uh, particularly cases in British Columbia. Uh, you know, there, there's um, yet another decision finding this regulatory scheme to be too restrictive and to violate the rights of people that benefit from the use of, of cannabis-based medicine. So uh, hopefully it not only assists people to charge now, but, it, but I would say assists in, you know, obviously the government has to respond to this, and hopefully they respond to it in a way that uh, really makes this safe and effective natural health product more readily available to people that are benefiting from it. Right, that's awesome. And so, but I meant specifically in Owen's cases as well. Will that have some effect on Owen's coming cases? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't hear that, Jeremy. Sorry. Sorry, Kirk. I was just saying specific to Owen. Will it help his particular cases? Well, you know, that's, that's quite interesting, right? I mean, I, certainly losing would have hindered his ability to argue that it was necessary to produce these products. Uh, I think that, you know... I, don't, I probably don't want to comment on that, to be honest with you, Jeremy, because I don't know the implications, and I need to really think them through before I make any kind of comment. I understand. Uh, but it's not sure. a huge victory for Owen personally, because, you know, Owen isn't doing this for Owen. Uh, Owen is doing this for the patients and the people that benefit from this product. If Owen was in this for Owen, uh, we could have pled him out 
sort of on day one, and he probably would have received a discharge, and that would have been the end of it. I mean, he's carried this on his shoulders for an awfully long time, and it's going to be a further battle. So, you know, Owen's one of the heroes here, um, and he's doing it for, uh, really for the cause of the benefit from it. Right. So, Kirk, I guess, as it stands now then, for medical marijuana patients, they can rest easy when it comes to edibles and hash, at least in this interim period. Yeah, sorry, man. I, one, of the, one of the detriments of living in the country is bad cell phone reception. <laughs> Kirk, I, was just, not here. I just wanted to ask that. For, so, as it sits now, for medical marijuana patients... Um, they should be okay with edibles and hash, at least for the next interim period. Yes, if you have an authorization to possess marijuana, uh, it used to be an authorization to possess dried marijuana, but now it's marijuana. Uh, according to this judge's ruling, you ought to be permitted to possess marijuana in all its forms listed in Schedule 2, uh, which includes cannabis resin and the various uh, compounds uh, that are present in the plant. Now, you know, let's be very careful uh, how much people can rely on that, particularly outside of British Columbia. It's very, very unclear. You know, the fact that this ruling has been handed down uh, is a great development in the law. But on the ground, you know, it, it doesn't mean that you can sort of expect that police aren't going to uh, take police enforcement action. The Crown isn't going to seek to prosecute, particularly outside of British Columbia. It is... Uh, you know, I wouldn't want people to sort of think that this is uh, some kind of, well, or you still need to be cautious. Let's put it. Oh, are you there, Kurt? I'm here. Okay, yeah, so you still need to be cautious. So that's good to know. So I guess, Kirk, we'll have you back on um, over the next few days or as this is uh, progressing, I guess next week, to find out how things go. I think we'll well, nothing's on for next week, but uh, we're back on the 25th for jury selection date, and then the 27th to argue about the, uh, the stay. The 27th, okay, so it's closer to the end of the month. All right, well, we'll have you back right after you guys do. There was a, there was a, you should have a funny moment when the judge uh, uh, said that the 20th was available for uh, <laughs> further argument in the case, and you could, you could sort of feel the courtroom... Uh, uh, either stifling a bit of laughter or sort of gasping. <laughs> and so it was available, but it, you guys didn't take it, obviously. Yeah, I don't think I don't think either the crowd or I was available on the 20th of April this exactly. year. Exactly. So are you, I'm assuming that you'll be here in Vancouver, Kirk. Well, I've got an engagement in the morning, uh, but I'm hoping to be there in the afternoon. Excellent. It's going to be a big day. It'll be a lot of fun. Kirk, thanks a lot for coming on today and keeping us all informed with what's happening, and congratulations on the, the big win, and uh, I hope it continues to go as smoothly as it did today. Thanks, Jeremy. I appreciate it, and uh, uh, thanks to all your viewers uh, for the time. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Kirk. We'll talk soon. You too. Bye. Peace. All right, Kirk Tusaw, the uh, winning case today. So I guess it's not quite as clear cut as the news stories would have had it this morning. There is information on the front page of CannabisCulture.com about that case. If you guys want to find out more, go check out CannabisCulture.com. And uh, so I think, Marius, what we'll do is we'll play one of the videos I had in the little interim period here. And when we come back, we'll have Mama Kind on to talk about her new book. And also, she will be doing a reading here at Cannabis Culture Headquarters in Vancouver on 420. So there's a big 420 reading. We'll talk to her about that uh, as well. And I, I think there's a blog post and an article going up about that soon as well. So there'll be more information on the front page about that. Marius, the clip I wanted to play was the one from Russia Television. Now, this is a clip. It's an interview with the author of a book called The New Jim Crow, which really looks good. And this is a great interview. And I just wanted to show this to you guys. And on the other side, we'll bring Mama Kind on. Is it loaded up, Marius? All right, check this out. Now, we often talk about the mass incarceration system here. In fact, the U.S. now has the largest known prison population in the world. But as if that wasn't disturbing enough, we also have to be honest 
about who it is that's targeted and affected most by a tough on crime mentality. Now, our guest tonight put the shocking statistic into the spotlight that there are more African Americans under correctional control today, in prison or jail, on probation or parole, than were enslaved in 1850, a decade before the Civil War began. Now, the results of entering into the correctional system are long lasting creating a second class of citizens who are stripped of their voting rights, excluded from juries, legally discriminated against in employment, housing, access to education, and public benefits. And in fact, as our guest also points out, as of 2004, more African American men were disenfranchised due to felon disenfranch disenfranchisement laws than in 1870, the year that the 15th Amendment was ratified prohibiting laws that explicitly deny the right to vote on the basis of race. So at a time the U.S. has its first black president, had we properly addressed a criminal justice system in which racism in many respects is still prevalent. Joining me to discuss it is Michelle Alexander, civil rights advocate and author of the book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Color Blindness. Michelle, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. And, uh, you know, you've gotten a lot of attention for this book, and rightly so, right? How can it not get a, a lot of attention, especially when you put statistics out there like that? But what do you think took so long for people to really start talking about this issue, for it to become something that's more acceptable in the media? Well, I think many of us have been more or less lulled to sleep about uh, the true nature of mass incarceration in America. Um, after all, prisons are out of sight, out of mind. Um, most prisons are located in predominantly white rural areas. That's where most new prison construction has occurred. And those who cycle in and out of our prisons and jails are typically folks who are living in uh, racially segregated, ghettoized communities. Um, and so this cycle and system of mass incarceration happens outside of the conscious awareness of, you know, most mainstream white Americans in particular who rarely have any contact with the criminal justice system today. You know, today the whites only signs are gone. Um, black folks are no longer relegated to the back of the bus and are free to eat in any restaurant. Um, but the reality is, is that a new caste-like system has emerged thanks to the war on drugs and the Get Tough movement. Millions of people overwhelmingly poor folks of color have been swept into our criminal justice system primarily for nonviolent and drug related offenses the very sorts of crimes that occur with roughly equal frequency in middle class white neighborhoods and on college campuses but go largely ignored swept into our criminal justice system branded criminals and felons and then stripped of the very right supposedly won in the civil rights movement like the right to vote, the right to serve on juries, the right to be free of legal discrimination. Well, let, me, let, me, let me bring up too, you know, uh, yeah, if you, if you look back on it, it's this, this tough on crime, this war on drugs that really is what, what started it, right? What is, where, is what got us to where we are today in terms of the numbers and in terms of the figures if you look at it. But, you know, you've also mentioned that if you look at historians, political scientists, they'll say that trying to get the working class white over to the Republican Party also may have had something to do with it? Yes, absolutely. You know, um, numerous historians and political scientists have now documented that the war on drugs was part of a grand Republican Party strategy known as the Southern Strategy of using racially coded get tough appeals on issues of crime and welfare to appeal to poor and working class whites, particularly in the South, who are anxious about, resentful of, fearful of many of the gains of African Americans in the civil rights movement. And pollsters and political strategists found that thinly veiled promises to get tough on a group of people not so subtly defined by race could be enormously successful in persuading poor and working class whites to defect from the Democratic New Deal coalition and join the Republican Party in droves. It was part of the effort, the strategic effort, to flip the South from blue, from Democratic, to red, to Republican. And so when President Ronald Reagan declared his drug war in 1982, it was an attempt to make good on campaign promises to get tough on a group of people who had been defined not so subtly in the media and political discourse as black and brown. Well, and well these days, uh, you know, these days people still very much, no politician wants to look like they don't want to be tough on crime. And yet, 
crime rates are at historic lows. But do you think that there is, uh, you know, something that can be drawn to say that if crime rates are at historic lows, does it have something to do with historically high prison populations? Well, no, actually, you know, sociologists and criminologists today now kind of acknowledge that there is very little correlation between crime rates and incarceration rates. Our prison population has quintupled uh, in I think we may have lost Michelle there, but we're going to tr Oh, I think she's back. Michelle, are you still there? We lost you. Uh, we lost audio. For a, for a minute there, but uh, we're you know we're running out of time, and so I just want to uh, before we have to hit our next break, get to you talking to you about the Trayvon Martin case, and I just want to know what you think about it, how you think that it fits into what it is that you write about, because that's clearly been dominating the news cycle lately. Yes, well, you know, I think in many ways the mentality of George Zimmerman reflects the mentality of many in law enforcement today. You know, it's easy to demonize George Zimmerman for what he did um, by nearly stalking a young black man because of the way he looked and being in the wrong neighborhood. Well, uh, you know, that mentality of viewing young black men as a problem um, who need to be dealt with harshly, who need to be interrogated and stopped and questioned, that is the mentality that dominates you know, most law enforcement agencies today. Um, if George Zimmerman had had, you know, a badge with his gun, we wouldn't even know Trayvon Martin's name today. The New York Police Department, you know, reported that in one year alone, in 2010, um, the NYPD stopped and frisked more than 600,000 people, um, more than 80% of whom were black and Latino. And in only a tiny fraction of those stops and searches, was there any kind of suspect description or investigation into a criminal case. So we have hundreds of thousands of young black and brown men being stopped, frisked, searched, viewed as a suspect without any evidence of you no know, criminal activity, without any reasonable suspicion or probable cause, greatly increasing the odds that a young black man um, will get caught with a little marijuana in his pocket or get caught doing something wrong and wind up in prison for the very kinds of mistakes that occur on college campuses, et cetera, and get ignored. I mean, studies have consistently shown now for decades that contrary to popular belief, people of color are no more likely to use or sell illegal drugs than whites, but because they are stopped, frisked, searched at grossly disproportionate rates, um, they are incarcerated at grossly disproportionate rates. In fact, in some states, 80 to 90% of all drug offenders sent to prison have been African-American. And once locked up, you are permanently locked out um, of many categories of employment, locked out of public housing, and some states denied even food stamps to survive. So for the rest of your life, you're relegated to a permanent second-class status um, for making the same kinds of mistakes that young people in middle-class white neighborhoods get to make as they're trotting off to college. Yeah, and of course, you know, that being part of the problem, too, is that uh, if you have no voice, how do you get more people to, to know that this problem exists and to pay attention to it and to try to change it? Michelle, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. All right, we're back. So, what are you smoking, Lisa? Mama kind. and champagne and watermelon. Fantastic. And you're and gonna smoke some oil, you said. And some oil, some oil, yes. So we have Mama Kind in the house here, live. In, in, she's actually in studio with us, and her head is almost bigger than mine as it sits right now on the screen here. Where's the speaker? Oh yeah, uh, on the top there. That's probably the best way. Oh, we're gonna mic you a little bit better right now, so they can hear your lovely voice as well as see your lovely image. We have to move this chair. All right, cool. So Mama Kind, your you have a new book, and you're going to be doing a reading of it here in Vancouver very soon, aren't you? I am. Yeah, that's the one. Why don't you tell us about the book first, and then tell us about the reading after? Okay. Well, the, uh, the book is about sex, and it's about pot. <laughs> it's a collection of all of my uh, writings about uh, my sex and relationship advice columns from Skunk Magazine over the years, all collected in one, one book with quizzes and 
uh, personal stories, I call my roach play column, and it's all put together in one book, uh, Ed Rosenthal, the guru of ganja, put it together. That's awesome. And it's, I mean, it just came out not too long ago. I've seen the book. We have it in our store downstairs. It's quite a nice book. Can we see it? Can you hold it up again and check yes. out the binding? It's Absolutely. quite beautifully put together. And now I see these images, uh, this sort of cartoony image of you. Who is the artist who produces that image? Um, his name is Nico, and he's been the uh, art director at Skunk Magazine for, for forever, basically. Uh, he actually used to work for Marvel Comics. He's, he's incredible. He's very, very good. And uh, I was very lucky that he agreed to come on and uh, on this project and uh, illustrate it. Because it is, it is very well illustrated. I mean, I just do words, but I know when something when something looks good. Let's see if I can turn it to something that. Ooh, look at this. E. Mm. There you go. Very cute. Very nice. Very very um, nice. Yeah. <laughs> so is it based on actual photos that he's taken of you? First of all. Well, I worked. I actually worked with him. Like I said, um, he's the art director at Skunk, so I've worked there for years. Uh, I was in Montreal for. Um, just over two years, uh, and uh, so we work together. So he knows me, uh, and he knows me well enough to give me skinny arms, whether I have them or not. <laughs> so uh, I love him for it. And uh, yeah, here, this is a cute illustration. I like this one. This is the um, Are You a Pot Snob quiz. Hilarious. And uh, you can kind of <laughs> do do that. That looks like great. Special Dutch spring water and yada yada. Very cool. cool. So there's all kinds of little quizzes in there, and um, again, lots of sex relationship uh, advice uh, questions over the years. Some of them with pot in them, some of them not with pot, some questions just about pot. Uh, I always joke that I get the questions, the pot questions that you'll never ask Ed. Uh, so those are the ones that I get. <laughs> and like, um, if strong in your fun. grow room will help your plants grow. Ah, and what's the answer to that one? I guess we'll have to think so. find out in the book. Maybe. I think so, for several reasons. This is my thinking. Okay, first of all, plants, uh, they actually have, have within themselves, they're called phyto, phytoestrogens and the hormones that, uh, you know, sort of mimic similar hormones that we have in our body that are uh, related to our sexual system. And uh, I think that if you, you can kind of like give off that energy, you know, and like get those hormones stimulated. You know, if you're in a room with a really, really, really horny person, you Happens have to, all the time. to like feel their vibe, right? Same sort of idea. And I think also, if you are having lots of sex, then you're probably gonna be in a good mood and you'll probably take care of your babies just that much better because you're in a good mood, I would think, yeah. Yeah, that makes I, sense. I no? agree, I agree. It does make some sense. <laughs> so, as long as you're not knocking anything over, that's the important thing, or switching anything. Yeah, you, you don't want to start any unnecessary fires. Around a little bit. <laughs> but uh, I've done it, I don't know. I'm sure I'm not the only one. <laughs> oh, I, I doubt you are. I'm sure that it's probably, well, and it would make for good photo photos as well, I think, or, you know, anything in a grow room, any kind of photos, anything shot in a grow room looks great to me, so. Well, I think if it's not, if, it, if you don't actually get direct pleasure from it, then it should be good, for, at least for cool uh, pics. It should be good for cool girly pics, like pussy toking, for example. <laughs> pussy like, toking. You said this in your email. So Explain this to me. Stories sex plot about pussy toking. <laughs> what is pussy toking? What What is pussy toking? Give me, tell me what well, pussy toking is. It's sort of based on the idea that you know that urban myth of that woman that goes into the ER with a champagne bottle suction cup to her cervix. Yes, I've heard that one before. So, if you I thought it was the real same though. idea of like using the suction, you, theoretically, you should be able to insert a bong with like a finger so the water doesn't come out, and then slowly pull the bong out, and okay. it should create suction enough to draw on the flame and actually light the bong. Oh, wow. And by which you're taking a vaginal bong hit. <laughs> kind of sounds dangerous, though, or something, you know? How? Well, the, the fire close to genitals yeah. and all that. <laughs> I, well, see, I recommend to have, um, there's actually a, one of the stories in, in the book is about uh, my trying it uh -huh. by myself. 
on psychedelics, which I don't recommend. I don't recommend doing that. I recommend on psychedelics. Yeah, yeah, it was a it was a weird thing. Um, <laughs> so that that I did kind of run the risk of shish kebabing my uterus with, with my bone. But now I know better. Now I know better. And uh, you should always have eager assistance. Right. And and uh, you know uh, be very careful about you know what you're doing and choose the right bong and everything and it should be safe. I don't suggest pregnant women do it. But then again, I couldn't tie my shoes when I was pregnant, let alone put a paraphernalia around my, my hoo-hoo, so uh, maybe that was just me. Right. But yeah. So uh, there's like, you know, for example, this bong right here, Mr. Bumpy. Mr. Um, Bumpy, yes. Mr. Bumpy. He's, it looks for bumpy. Which, on which I'm going to take a celebratory oil hoot today. Excellent. I have I have a card and I, I want to again extend my congratulations to Ted and Owen and Kirk and and everybody I think it's just an amazing thing that's gone down and uh, yeah so this is a um, celebratory oil freedom naked freedom tote excellent and this is Mr. Bumpy and uh, Mr. Bumpy is uh, going to be in one of my next pussy token stories oh wow all right Mr. Bumpy. Not right now, though. Not right now. I understand. Well, and I have, oh, there's a few of those bongs downstairs. Yeah. And, oh, nice. And what are you smoking? Um, this is Cheezel. Oh, Hemp Star. And then uh, the oil is sort of a melange, shall we say, of uh, several strains. Nice. Yeah. All right, I'm sure they can check it out. How's it look, Maurice? Looks good. Let's see it, dude. Nice. I like the whole Skype thing. This is one of our first successful Skypings on the big screen, I think. Looks great. <laughs> Yay! Hell yeah. Excellent. Yeah, we like to hit a lot of bongs Damn. on the show. Mr. Bumpy, I don't have Princess with me. Usually I have a big, huge bong here. Princess, she's 36 inches tall. She, yes, the ladies are impressed with her size, usually. And But yeah, she, that Mr. Bumpy looks pretty... Uh, looks a little uncomfortable. No, I don't know. <laughs> he's, he's bumped for her pleasure, though. Bumped for her pleasure. Uh, <laughs> so, mama kind. I always, when I was a kid growing up, you know the, some of the propaganda they use against pot? is always that it kills your sex drive. You know, when I, I remember hearing that a lot of times, and I remember hearing some old man complaining, oh yeah, that stuff will, you know, give you a softy and... I, I always used to hear that, but I, I always thought that pot was an aphrodisiac. When I was smoking pot with girls, they always seemed to enjoy those kinds of activities. So, I don't know. Pot is an aphrodisiac, what do you think? How it's, it's one of the oldest known uses for it. Of course it's an aphrodisiac. Um, one of the things that uh, cannabis does when you, when you uh, consume it is it that it raises your oxytocin levels and oxytocin, they call it the cuddling hormone. Um, and it's also a hormone that's given off when you have an orgasm, also actually when you give birth, and it's, uh, it gives us a feeling of um, closeness and trust with the people that we're with. It raises our dopamine levels, uh, which makes us feel good, of course, and then it lowers our, um, our, our um, lactin levels, lactin, prolactin levels, sorry. Um, which are stress hormones that, that uh, you know, can have serious long-term effects on your health. So uh, there's only two ways that you can quickly dump a bunch of oxytocin into your system. Either consume some cannabis or uh, have an orgasm. And so there's something that says something to me. If those are the only two ways you can do that, that says something to me. So I say, you know, do them both together and it will exponentially be even better, right? Um, it's just ridiculous to suggest that, that uh, it's not an aphrodisiac. Of course, people have been using it for just as long as we've been using, uh, using cannabis. So uh, that's, that's silly. And in fact, the nice thing about it, especially as we have an aging population and um, you know Viagra sales are going through the roof, you want to consider that it's one of the few sort of uh, substances that people will take for fun, recreational um, substances that are good for both men and women. Because most of them, let's say alcohol, even
even, you know, cocaine, MDMA, I could give you a long list of them, where maybe mentally men want to get it on, and they're like, they're into it in their heads, but it's just not working for the other head, you know what I mean? It, it just doesn't doesn't really happen, <clears throat> whiskey dick. <laughs> so, um, cannabis, you don't have that. Right. I, I've never heard of anyone. I've never heard of anyone like, oh, I smoke a joint, I can't get it up. Uh, it's amazing. <coughs> it, 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 you know, it, it, that's kind of the whole point of how you kind of get it up is, is you know, uh, dilating those vasos. Right. Well, and actually, David Malmo Levine downstairs in his herb museum has can bottles, actually, that were made, you know, almost 100 years ago that have cannabis in them that were intended as aphrodisiacs as well, I believe. Absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. This is not, this is, is, you know, it's knowledge that we're rediscovering is, is all it is. Um, the last book that was put out uh, about pot and uh, sex was in the 70s, you know, it was just when I was, I think it was actually put out the year I was born, how ironic. Wow. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, you know, and before that, there was very little until, before, you know, when Prohibition started. Uh, this is knowledge we've always had. We've always, you know, we've always possessed. We're just, because of Prohibition, we're, gonna, we're having to remind ourselves and, and relearn it and act like, oh, my gosh, what do you mean, Pots and Aphrodisiac? We've always known it. Hello, David. There's David. Hey, she can see me. She can, see, can you. see you. We're living in the 21st century. David, we were, we're just talking, talking about... about you. Pot as an aphrodisiac. You know, history of cannabis as an aphrodisiac and, and how, you know... In your museum, I suggested that and you may have some sort true. of uh, and then how pharmaceutical remnant or something like, intended for that purpose by a pharmaceutical company. Uh, for the first time ever, just recently, the museum acquired an ancient Yohimbi medicine bottle Whoa. to go with its ancient uh, Damiana bottles to round out the aphrodisiac section so wow nice. and, and we're also going to have aphrodisiac chocolates for sale in the herb museum so you can come get high and get horny there you go well i'm going to be there yeah next week for my book signing fan freaking tell perfect me transition now. perfect segue are tell you, us about the book signing what's happening are you naked she is naked he doesn't have a I, stitch I, of clothes I on. I am naked. It's a <laughs> celebration of freedom. There's Yay! A joint. I kind of wish that I'm every guest on my it. show would do the Yay. same. Yay! Yay! You're you're Yay. naked. And so what's happening next week? <laughs> I believe I believe it's seven till nine at the CC Vapor Lounge. That's right, right here. Is on the what third floor? That's right, third floor, third 307 floor. West Hastings, Vancouver, British Columbia. Exactly. Um, I'm having a, a book signing for my book, Sex Pot, The Marijuana Lover's Guide to Get It In On. And uh, <laughs> I'll be doing some readings for my book. I'll do like, we'll be doing little Q&As. Maybe we'll do a quiz or something like that. Maybe the, there might be some music. I don't know. Either way, there'll be lots of beat. Well, I'm sure it'll be fun. Um, it's 420 plus one, so it's on a Saturday. Right, so okay, the day, the day after, after 420, 420, that's right. And you're looking on, like, what am I doing Saturday night? This is what you're doing. Cool. You know, it's perfect timing right before you go out and get it on later on in the evening, right? Right, a little yeah. foreplay. Hey, and listen, foreplay what, 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 what are those tattoos you got there? My tattoos? Yeah. Well, this, the one that's most uh, appropriate is this. Ah. Uh -huh. This the is skunk. my uh, Sparky tattoo. Nice. Skunky. You might recognize from Skunk Magazine. Yes, you got this skunk on. That means on. I get a lifetime subscription. Very ah, cool. Ah, that's right. And there then, you go. what are your <laughs> shoulder tattoos? Um, everybody <laughs> always gets mom or dad, right? Yeah. So I've got son. Son. Yep. That's from my son. He picked that one. They're actually two separate tattoos I got. And yeah. then I have daughter. Uh -huh. I have a lot of in that one. I have several other ones which I'm not going to show you right now because uh, <laughs> for another show. For standing up and not showing you the parts I don't want to show you yet. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. It'd be best that I not do that. Right. Can't show all your Maybe tattoos live. at once. You live on the internet right, right now. Get to see the other tattoos. How about? <laughs> wow. There you go. The girls Seven. of the internet. I'll go online with them any day. <laughs> all right. Oh, good Simpsons reference. David. See you later. Bye, David. Yeah. See you on 421. Huh? See you online at chess.com. Yes. Absis Murphy, Pazaloo.
So, See you, naked lady. So the reading, are you going to be here for 420 as well? I will be there for 420, absolutely. I'm going to be uh, hanging out. I'm not sure if I'm going to be doing anything, you know, I don't know, speaking or anything like that, but I'm going to be around. So look for the six foot tall, crazy redhead chick that looks like me. <laughs> and who's that though? That's your sister or something? I'll be around. I'll be around for sure. I'm going to be uh, uh, attending the uh, events at the library. The last time I was there um, was in 2006, I believe. Really? And, wow. Uh, it's about time then. My goodness. It was like 5,000, 6,000 people or something like that. Oh, it's and I was, four I times that now. I had gone to the previous ones, but I just remember being absolutely blown away. So I can't even really wrap my head around mm -hmm. what. Uh, but it, how many is it now? 20,000? Yeah, it's like 20 to 25,000, I think we know, in the last couple of years. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to kind of wrap my head around that whole thing. There. It wraps right around the art gallery. It's going to be incredible. Yeah, we shut the streets down. It's a lot of fun. And it's, I can't wait. I can't wait for it. And, and then, of course, the next day, and you know, you're recovering from 420. You want to go come out to the signing. I, I want to say something, too, uh, that I think, and this is of course, because I wrote the book, but also I think it's really important, you know, if you ever hear of any book signings or anything to do with magazines, books, when it comes to um, our culture, cannabis culture, um, please support them uh, because uh, literature is, is, first of all, it's a symbol of, of how strong our culture is, that the fact that we have our own literature, both fiction and nonfiction, it's also the way that we get our information out there. Um, you know, before there was the internet, right? Uh, but also, still, while there's the internet, believe it or not, magazine subscriptions have gone up uh, since the internet. Why? Because people see the information online and then they go and, and get the magazine, which they can take home and, and read. So, whether it's magazines, books, whatever it is, um, try and support your local writers because they're the ones that are, are going out there and, and um, trying to get the truth out there. Uh, and, uh, you know, or possibly just entertaining us or, you know, there's all, all different reasons, but they kind of symbolize uh, the health of our um, community and, and of our movement, I think, anyways. So, uh, Absolutely. yeah, you know, come out. If you can't come out next week uh, for my signing, then uh, please try and make another event that you hear of that might have something to do with... Um, uh, you know, the writers, uh, pot writers. Yeah, print, I, I am actually a print guy, I love print, and I, it's too bad that cannabis culture doesn't do a print thing anymore, but there's a lot of print out there alive and kicking, and it's, we need to support it as much as possible too. But as you said, I know the internet's been good for everything. It, magazine subscriptions, I think there was probably a lull for a little bit, but now everything seems to be back up and rolling. And yeah, and, and that's the thing though, what, what it's all about nowadays is, is uh, it's not magazines or the internet, books or the internet. It's it's it's, it's all integrated now, right? Yeah. It's all kind of one, and and you know, um, so uh, you kind of have to support it all. There's something to be said for I I have a place in my heart for for printed word, of course, and I like something that you can hold in your hand, and you know, I like paper, and that's just maybe that's just me, but um, tactile. So, yes, please do support uh, the printed page. But just literature in general and, and writers and, and uh, um, you know, professional writers, again, in, in our culture, it's really important to um, support our media because, you know, how strong, that's why your show is so important and, and wonderful because, uh, and pot TV in general, um, you know, when I started, when I started in um, publishing, it was at Cannabis Culture, um, Mark Emery hired me brought me out to DC and that was my very first job working with uh, Dana Larson uh, when he was editor-in-chief there that's and right. that's when Plot TV was just sort of starting out too and it was extremely exciting and it was it was wonderful and and it was so important um, you know, so incredibly important uh, you know at that time as much as it is now to, to get the information out and you know, that's what it did, and that's what you're continuing to do now, and I, I applaud you for it, and I thank you for it. So, uh... Well, we're happy to do it. Jeez, you really need your own show, Mama Kind. You oh. would be, you would be perfect. You're a perfect candidate for a Pod TV show. Radio. 
<laughs> no, no, you could uh, you could definitely have a show. Uh, I don't, I'm surprised you don't I think already. I hiding behind. You know, I have to say it's weird for me because I for well, I've never really had my picture in the magazines and stuff like that. I I I'm a writer, so I I write and I've always used um, a cartoon. Those wonderful illustrations that sort of kind of represent me, you know, with the skinny arms. Uh, so it's not a picture of, of me. So I'm. It's only recently that I've been more comfortable being more uh, out there, and people recognize my my face. I always get kind of a little weirded out when someone's like, "Hey, your mama kind of like." I do know me, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So it's it's kind of a, a strange thing. Huh. Well, and so where do people find out more about you if they want to find you online? Uh, well, um, you can. Uh, online, you can go to mamakind.com, that's M-A-M-A-K-I-N-D, uh, that's sort of where I've been starting to collect my blogs and things like that. There's the puffingtonhost.com, uh, I'll have blogs on there, I've had blogs on um, Celeb Stoner, it's the first email blogger on Celeb Stoner. Awesome. <laughs> um, and of course, Cannabis Culture, and, and uh, yeah, I'm going to have a blog out shortly there. Um, and, you know, of course, you can catch me in print in Skunk Magazine every issue. I'm still the uh, editor-at-large there. And so I still do my Pillow Talk column and uh, all sorts of other articles. Um, and I think that's, you can go to quicktrading.com if you want to look for the book there. Otherwise, you can go to amazon.com. Uh, I always encourage you to walk into your local hemp store and pick up the book there. Uh, you know, that's always the best. If you can't do that, go to your local indie bookstore. If you can't do that, you know, uh, get it where you can get it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and the very best thing you could do is if you are in the Vancouver area next week, uh, around like 7 o'clock-ish or so, up at the CC Vapor Lounge, I'll be there doing a reading, and I will sign the books for you. I'm also giving $5 of every book sale to uh, Mark and uh, his commissary funder, wherever it needs to go. Oh, that's really nice. So uh, then if, you're gonna, if you're thinking of maybe buying a book, um, buy it then. That's the best time you can do it. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's that's what I would suggest. You can also, yeah, you can get it online. Skunkonlinestore.com, I believe, also carries it. And I think the bookstore, the ZZ bookstore, probably carries it as well. I believe we do, yeah. I've seen it downstairs, so. Yeah. I'm not sure if we have any copies left, but. <clears throat> Well, uh -huh. we'll try and fix that. But like I said, I'll sign it if you come next week. Saturday. Great. great. <coughs> I need a glass of water. Saturday. Uh, and so, yeah, that's 307 West Hastings. Come down here Saturday. That's 421. Mama Kind, thank you very much for coming on the show today. I'd love to have you back again. This was awesome. Sure. This is like our most successful Skyping ever. Our really only yeah. successful one, pretty much. I mean. Right on. Yeah, we've done it on the little laptop before, but you're you look beautiful on the big screen. Nice. <coughs> Fantastic. Thank you, sweetie. Thanks for having me on and I can't wait to see you all next week. We're gonna have you back and we'll definitely see you next week. Marius, do you want to uh take us out? I think that's the end of it. We, do we have any I didn't have any other clips I wanted to play. I believe that was the end of the show. So thank you guys very much for watching. We won't be back next week because of 420 itself. Now hopefully we will have some sort of live feed going on next week for 420. Um, I'm not 100% on whether that's gonna happen or not. We're working the details out, but hopefully it'll be all day 420. I know that they'll be broadcasting from Toronto as well in the morning, so there'll be a Toronto 420 and then a Vancouver 420, so that should be pretty fun. Oh, the anonymous clip. I did want to play one more clip, and um, we'll play this on the end of the show. I won't come back. I'll say bye to you guys first. But anonymous this week released a video calling for on 420 all kinds of activism related to marijuana legalization, and they are actually putting out an educational campaign in the same regard. They want people to change all their social media pictures to things to do with pot. They want people to use the hashtag um, pound op cannabis. And in this little, there's two videos actually, I'll play them back to back. The second video uh, explains a little bit about, uh, about Anonymous. They talked to a guy named Nuke from Anonymous about their campaign and he gives a little bit more information about it there. He says there may be some activities on that day, maybe corporations that aren't friendly to this kind of thing being, he said lulls, so I don't know what that really means in Anonymous speak, but I don't know if, uh, we'll see what happens on 420. But uh, yeah, check this out and, 
we'll, we'll see you guys in two weeks, and I'll probably see you on 420 a little bit. We'll see what happens, but we'll keep you posted. Cannabisculture.com is where you go for all the info. Peace, guys. Bye, Mom Kind. Oh, uh, what? Before we leave, oh, to tell me which of the two anonymous videos you want to oh, watch. Play, there's only two, so play the, uh, they should be in the right order. Okay, both of them, okay. Okay. Sorry. All right. Peace, guys. Does it work? Dear citizens of the world, for far too long, cannabis has been oppressed by big corporations, big pharma and governments when it could be benefiting all of mankind, in many different levels. We have heard, and we have watched your government wise and deceived you, on all of the dangers of cannabis. Show support by making your profile pictures green this 20th April, on your social network profiles. Operation Cannabis Phase 1. Initiated. We are anonymous. Expect us. I'll let you know. Good radio host would know that. Right now we're joined by Nuke. Uh, he's here to talk about Operation Cannabis 420. What is Operation Cannabis 420, man? Well, uh, we are trying to get uh, medical marijuana legalized uh, pretty much everywhere in the states. I know right now there's not too many states that have it, and even then they're being scrutinized by the federal government since the feds still call it illegal. So we're just trying to get it legalized for everybody in all states. What's the um, the main, like, uh, source of attack? Are you guys just going to, as anonymous, just going to use, like, uh, the Internet and, like, the social networks to get everybody to rally together? Or like a like how, what are they, how they plan on uh, trying to change it? Yeah, well, we're gonna try to get as many people as we can to spread the word and rally together. I know there's a bunch of uh, movements that are gonna be happening on 420 at a lot of different locations. Um, we're also gonna try to hit up. I know we've got Coke of the Town already uh, spreading the message. Uh, the Weed Blog is spreading it too. Uh, there's supposed to be somebody from High Times spreading it, but we haven't heard back from them. So, uh, but we have two big things already sharing it. So, we've reached a lot of people. I think our YouTube video has about 18,000 views. So it's pretty good. Just, considering it's been only about three days. Yeah, just the group that has started uh, is uh, <laughs> pretty crazy, dude. Like it keeps sending me like notifications. Like there's a shitload of uh, talking going on. Oh yeah, on the the Facebook event, there's there's been a lot, a lot of people really active in it, and you know there's been a couple of people that are kind of negative about it. I'm not sure what the deal is, but the majority of it's positive. Um, is it is it something like we're on on four on four twenty that? Is everybody just supposed to get stoned and go out and talk about weed, or is there like a uh, is, are people supposed to like uh, you know protest anywhere, or like what, what kind of a? Uh, I know there's a lot of protests going up, and in that Facebook group, there's been a lot of people. I think there's one uh, in, in Ohio. There's there's a lot of them going up, like kind of like the Occupy, you know how they did in Wall Street. There's just a bunch of protests that are going to be happening and. You know, anonymous will take to the internet like we always do, and it'll be it'll be fun. There'll be some moles involved too. Might see some big companies that are against it supporting it on 420. You never know whether they like it or not. They might be. <laughs> uh, I, I I got a question for our student from Vermont. Um, what what is the the marijuana situation like uh, in Vermont? Like, are you guys legal or? Uh, in Vermont. They Yeah, I yeah. Your call, man. That was awesome. I think an, this this whole anonymous coming out with Operation Cannabis in support of legalization is awesome. I mean, we, it's it, it's great to have a key player such as them on our side. I think because this has been a long fought battle. 
For sure, man. I, I I totally agree. I think it's cool that Anonymous is uh I think I think Anonymous is uh, the, the number number one, ranked number one, and uh, at least at least uh, getting shit started on the internet. They're really good at uh, uh, making uh, politicians and people uh, stop in their tracks and uh, listen for a second, even if they don't like uh, take it into consideration. They hear it. Uh, so Newt, uh, Operation. Uh, what is it? Let me get let me get back to it. You, you go ahead. You go ahead and uh, list it off so people can look for it on Facebook and join the fight. Well, it's Operation Cannabis 420. Uh, we've been having some problems uh, with people being able to search it, like on Facebook. It won't pop up at all. Uh, we have no idea why. But if you go to YouTube, you can find our video. 